This presentation is about the concept of stock keeping units, also known as SKUs. Stock keeping units are a really fundamental part of any warehouse, but they're really important in humanitarian settings as well, because the way you choose to define your SKUs and the way you work with them can really reduce the chance of making mistakes and improve the accuracy of stock keeping in a warehouse. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce the concept of SKUs. We're going to talk a little bit about why they are important, how to make a good SKU, and I'm going to include a few examples to try to put this knowledge into context. So what is a storekeeping unit? Well, a storekeeping unit is basically the building blocks for how we record and account for everything that's going on in our warehouse. An SKU is just a thing, an item in our warehouse, that we've defined in a particular way. Every stack of items in our warehouse is different in some way to every other stack of items, so each SKU is different to every other SKU. Each SKU has these attributes, properties or features, which make it different to every other SKU. Some of these features are as shown on the screen. In humanitarian warehouses, we normally are worried about who owns the particular item. That could be the project that the item is for, or it could be the donor who donated the item. We have to track the expiry date of perishables. And we also, in the SKU, define how we count items. Do we dispatch in kilograms? Do we dispatch in bags? Do we dis dispatch in pallet loads? Finally, each SKU also contains a designation, which is basically just a short phrase that describes the item. So, an SKU is not a piece of paperwork, it's not a form. It's really just a combination of information relating to a particular item in your warehouse. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of a stock card, which records movements in and out of particular specific items in the warehouse. The information at the top of the stock card is basically the SKU. You have the item description, here you have the donor, which represents the owner, you have the expiry date, although in this case it's blank, and you have the unit of measure on the top right here. You know that this particular item is measured in sets. So firstly, let's talk about the designation. The designation is a short phrase which should describe the item in such a way that it cannot be mixed up with any other item in the warehouse, even an item that's very similar. Using just the designation alone, somebody who is not a logistics officer should be able to go to the warehouse and pick out exactly the correct item they should not be able to mix it up with another very similar item. The designation does have to be short and concise though, it does have to fit on this paperwork. The designation could include any of these items, the color of the item, the weight of the item, the volume of the item. Picking what to put in your designation is a matter of judgment. For example, knowing the weight of a bag of sugar would be a really useful way of keeping track of that exact bag of sugar. But knowing the weight of a tarpaulin is not so useful. For the tarpaulin, you might decide to describe it as a blue tarpaulin or a tarpaulin with UN logo, something like that. Okay, let's take a quick example. Let's imagine you have just received a shipment of this item, a shovel. How would you go about selecting a designation for this item? Well, you have to choose a designation which makes sure that this shovel can't be mixed up with any other type of shovel. Even if you have no shovels in your warehouse just now, it's quite possible that in future there will be more shovels delivered. So your designation has to be good enough to make sure that those shovels can't be mixed up with this one. Here are some of the attributes of the item which you might choose to include 
in your designation. Remember, your designation has to be short, so you cannot include all of these items in the designation. Which items would you choose? Well, the shovel on the left has a very unique color. It's yellow and black. So that could be a really good way of reducing the chance of it being mixed up with any other shovel. The shovel is entirely metal. You could mention that. You could mention the material. You could also measure the, the handle and also the, the total length of the shovel and include that information because that's very easy to measure and somebody else could come back simply measure the shovel, compare it with what's in your designation, and then be absolutely sure whether they have the correct shovel or a different shovel. So, a bad designation here would be simply one word, shovel. Similarly, simply writing shovel, big, with handle, still isn't enough information to avoid mixing up this and other shovels. Here are two examples of really good item definitions. Shovel, black, black yellow handle, one meter. From this information, you can tell that uh, the shovel on the left is exactly the one that is being referred to. Similarly, shovel, metal, black yellow, 230 by 350 millimeters, that's the dimension of the metal part, one meter, that's the length. Either of these designations would be very likely to prevent any mix-ups of shovels occurring in the future. So, the designation should be clear enough to allow someone to uniquely identify that particular item in the warehouse. However, there are two possible situations which make life a little bit more complicated for us. Firstly, the expiry date. A particular item even with an absolutely perfect item designation, could still need to be tracked separately to another item with the same designation because it has a different expiry date. In other words, in your warehouse, you might have a stock of beans, that's food, that expires in October. This has to be tracked separately to any beans that expire in December. The second complication is that in a humanitarian warehouse, every item has some sort of owner. Perhaps a particular set of tools belongs to the water and sanitation department. Or perhaps a particular set of boxes of supplies came from a particular donor. Alternatively, perhaps some of the items in the warehouse don't belong to your organization, but to a partner organization. However, the most common type of ownership of items in a humanitarian warehouse is by projects. For example, if you have 100 identical hammers in your warehouse and 50 of them were purchased by project ABC1 and the other 50 were purchased by project ABC2, you have to track these products separately and that means you're going to create two storekeeping units with the same item designation because the item is exactly the same but a different owner. Why is this important? Well, imagine I gave you permission to take my laptop from my home in order to study humanitarian logistics one evening. If instead you came to my home and accidentally picked up my friend's laptop, which was exactly the same model, exactly the same color, and actually did exactly the same job, that would still be a problem, because this laptop does not belong to me, and therefore you should not have been taking it. You can see why it's important to track ownership in a humanitarian warehouse. The unit of measure defines how you count items in your warehouse. The unit of measure is part of the stockkeeping unit, and it is not the same as the packaging unit. The packaging unit is simply describing the way that things come when they are delivered by the supplier. For example, in the photo, we see five boxes on one pallet. So perhaps the supplier would call this one pallet, or perhaps the supplier would call this five boxes. Is that the best way for us to account for this item? Would we choose to measure 
these items in pallets? Well, on one hand, it would mean that the way that we measure things inside our warehouse matches what is on the delivery paperwork from the truck driver who delivered it. Similarly, pallets are very easy to count. There's a very low chance of making mistakes. So initially, this sounds like a pretty good way of measuring stuff in our warehouse. However, if you decide to record this as simply one pallet in your warehouse, so if your paperwork says one pallet, and you know that each pallet has 60 tarpaulins, imagine that one day a project manager comes to you and wants to distribute 40 tarpaulins. How do you record this in your paperwork? Well, 40 divided by 60 is 0 0.6666667. So, I guess that means you have to issue 0 0.6666667 pallets of tarpaulins. And what happens if a single tarpaulin is later returned to the warehouse because it wasn't distributed? You can see that recording in pallets, even though that was the way the items were delivered, is not a good way of recording and counting things in your warehouse. The most common problem in this area is choosing a unit of measure for your warehouse that is too large. When we decide how we're going to count things in a humanitarian warehouse, which unit we're going to use, we really want to pick the smallest possible unit that still sort of makes sense. Let's have an example. Let's say that from the delivery paperwork which came with the truck, you know that on every pallet there are 60 tarpaulins. You can see that these are arranged as 6 boxes of 10 tarpaulins each. We already decided that accounting in units of pallets is far too large for our warehouse. We could account in boxes, and this would allow us to give out the 40 boxes which the project manager requested. However, perhaps the project manager ne the next day will request 41 or 39, or he'll bring back an individual tarpaulin. The correct unit of measure, for this case, is the individual tarpaulin, because this is the smallest unit which still makes sense. It's really unlikely that the project manager will come to you and ask you to cut a tarpaulin in half, and then leave half in the warehouse, and take half with him. The tarpaulin is a unit, is the smallest unit you can possibly have, so therefore we should account in individual tarpaulins. What about if our delivery was of rolls of tarpaulin material and not individual tarpaulins? Let's say each pallet has five of these rolls, and we know that each roll is 60 meters in length. Accounting in pallets is probably not helpful for the same reason as before. 60 meters of tarpaulin material is quite a lot. In fact, it's very likely that someone will come to the warehouse and ask for 10 meters length, or 20 meters length. So they will cut part of a roll and take that with them. The best choice for the measuring unit in this case is, the, is, is part of a roll. In this example, we could have a designation of tarpaulin, UNHCR, 4 meter width rolls. The unit could be meters of length. One roll would be 60 meters of length, so therefore one pallet would be 300 meters of length. If you received one pallet of this product, you would account that as receiving a 300 meter length of this des designation of this SKU. Here is another challenging example. Imagine you have taken delivery of several boxes of nails. There are five different sizes of nails, so you have to create five stock keeping units, because each of these nails is different to the other. The designation of each stock keeping unit would probably include the length of the nail, the size of the nail, and also the type of nail. These are concrete nails, but that information is available on the packaging. What unit would you choose to account these nails in once they were inside your warehouse? Well, it might be possible to account in boxes of nails. However, a box can be quite a lot of nails, especially if it's a large box. You could also count individual nails, one by one, but this would be very time-consuming, and it's not necessary to track nails quite so precisely. In this case, there is a clever trick. We can use a unit that's not so obvious. The best unit of measurement for things like nails is by weight. 
that way, in the morning, you can issue one kilogram of nails, and if some are returned back, you can accept back, for example, 0 0.5 kilograms of nails. Here's another tricky example. Let's say that you've accepted delivery of a pallet of non-food item kits. Each kit contains five different items. It's a bag inside which there is a set of cutlery, a bar of soap, a towel, and so on. We're definitely not going to account by pallets, but should we account by kit bags or should we split into individual items? In this case, the correct answer is to account by kit bags. This is because your entire project is giving out these NFI kits. You're not going to be giving out one set of cutlery to one family and then a bar of soap the next day to another family. Every beneficiary will receive one entire kit, therefore this is the smallest unit which makes sense and this should be your SKU measuring unit. Choosing the correct and best measuring unit for items inside your warehouse is very important. However, sometimes confusion can arise between the differences in packaging unit and SKU measuring unit. The unit in which the supplier delivers may not match the unit which you want to measure in your warehouse. This is very important when a supplier is delivering goods according to a contract. In general, the stock reception form or goods received note has to match the contract in order to prove that the supplier delivered exactly what they said they would. For example, if a contract says that a company must supply 500 kilograms of cement, but it does not specify whether it should come in 10 kilogram bags, 25 kilogram bags, or 50 kilogram bags, the stock reception form should probably say 500 kilograms of cement received. This way it matches the contract and it's very clear that the supplier has fulfilled what they said they would do. However, inside your warehouse, you may wish to make the SKU measuring unit a 50 kilogram bag of cement. In this case, it is helpful to note on the stock reception form or goods received note that the bags came as 50 kilogram bags each. Finally, on the stock card, you can then enter the unit of 50 kilogram bag, and in this case, you would record 10 of that unit, that is 10 50 kilogram bags received. Now, remember this list of possible attributes of items in our warehouse? Some of these attributes might be mentioned as part of the SKU designation, but that doesn't mean that the remaining attributes are unimportant or can just be forgotten about. For example, a generator designation could simply say generator, blue, 8 kVA, petrol. But the warehouse team should still know the weight of the generator and its size because they need to be able to plan for its transportation. The warehouse team need to exercise good judgment and make sure that all relevant and important features about an item are recorded as part of the SKU. This can be done on the back of the stock record card or in a digital system if one is in use. To summarize, SKUs are the fundamental building blocks that dictate how you will count your stock in your warehouse. They define what you consider to be a unit for the purposes of accounting. These are the main elements making up an SKU. And the measuring unit is not necessarily the same as the unit in which the items are delivered. It's important to clearly note and record these differences to avoid any possible confusion.